May I just say some words? There are cynics who say that a party platform is something that no one bothers to read and it doesn't very often amount to much. Whether it is different this time than it has ever been before, I believe the Republican Party has a platform that is a banner of bold, unmistakable colors with no pale pastel shades. President Reagan's words are even more true today. Our party and our platform are important. The Republican Party platform is the very foundation upon which our party is built. Less government, lower taxes, marriage, family, and the sanctity of life. Providing a secure and free America for our children and grandchildren. These are not just words. They are the guiding principles upon which we govern. My fellow Americans, this is the 34th time I'll speak to you from the Oval Office and the last. We've been together eight years now, and soon it'll be time for me to go. But before I do, I wanted to share some thoughts, some of which I've been saving for a long time. It's been the honor of my life to be your president. So many of you have written the past few weeks to say thanks, but I could say as much to you. Nancy and I are grateful for the opportunity you gave us to serve. One of the things about the presidency is that you're always somewhat apart. You spend a lot of time going by too fast in a car someone else is driving and seeing the people through tinted glass, the parents holding up a child and the wave you saw too late and couldn't return. And so many times I wanted to stop and reach out from behind the glass and connect. Well, maybe I can do a little of that tonight. I've been reflecting on what the past eight years have meant and mean. And the image that comes to mind like a refrain is a nautical one. A small story about a big ship and a refugee and a sailor. It was back in the early 80s at the height of the boat people. And the sailor was hard at work on the carrier Midway, which was patrolling the South China Sea. The sailor, like most American servicemen, was young, smart, and fiercely observant. The crew spied on the horizon a leaky little boat and crammed inside were refugees from Indochina hoping to get to America. The Midway sent a small launch to bring them to the ship and safety. As the refugees made their way through the choppy seas, one spied the sailor on deck and stood up and called out to him. He yelled, hello, American sailor. Hello, freedom man. A small moment with a big meaning, a moment the sailor who wrote it in a letter couldn't get out of his mind. And when I saw it, Neither could I, because that's what it has to, it was to be an American in the 1980s. We stood again for freedom. I know we always have, but in the past few years, the world again, and in a way we ourselves rediscovered it. Ours was the first revolution in the history of mankind that truly reversed the course of government and with three little words, we the people. We the people tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We the people are the driver. The government is the car. And we decide where it should go and by what route and how fast. Almost all the world's constitutions are documents in which governments tell the people what their privileges are. Our constitution is a document in which we the people tell the government what it is allowed to do. We the people are free. This belief has been the underlying basis for everything I've tried to do these past eight years. But back in the 1960s when I began, it seemed to me that we'd begun reversing the order of things. That through more and more rules and regulations and confiscatory taxes, the government was taking more of our money, more of our options, and more of our freedom. I went into politics in part to put up my hand and say, stop. I was a citizen politician, and it seemed the right thing for a citizen to do. I think we have stopped a lot of what needed stopping. And I hope we have once again reminded people that man is not free unless government is limited. There's a clear cause and effect here that is as neat and predictable as a law of physics. As government expands, liberty contracts. Finally, there is a great tradition of warnings in presidential farewells. And I've got one that's been on my mind for some time. But oddly enough, it starts with one of the things I'm proudest of in the past eight years. The resurgence of national pride 
that I called the new patriotism. This national feeling is good, but it won't count for much, and it won't last unless it's grounded in thoughtfulness and knowledge. An informed patriotism is what we want. And are we doing a good enough job teaching our children what America is and what she represents in the long history of the world? Those of us who are over 35 or so years of age grew up in a different America. We were taught very directly what it means to be an American. And we absorbed almost in the air a love of country and an appreciation of its institutions. If you didn't get these things from your family, you got them from the neighborhood from the father down the street who fought in Korea, or the family who lost someone at Anzio. Or you could get a sense of patriotism from school. And if all else failed, you could get a sense of patriotism from the popular culture. The movies celebrated democratic values and implicitly reinforced the idea that America was special. TV was like that, too, through the mid-60s. But now we're about to enter the 90s, and some things have changed. Younger parents aren't sure that an unambivalent appreciation of America is the right thing to teach modern children. And as for those who create the popular culture, well-grounded patriotism is no longer the style. Our spirit is back, but we haven't re-institutionalized it. We've got to do a better job of getting across that America is freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of enterprise. And freedom is special and rare. It's fragile. It needs production. So we've got to teach history based not on what's in fashion, but what's important. Why the pilgrims came here, who Jimmy Doolittle was, and what those 30 seconds over Tokyo meant. You know, four years ago, on the 40th anniversary of D-Day, I read a letter from a young woman writing to her late father, who had fought on Omaha Beach. Her name was Lisa Zanata Hen, and she said, we will always remember, we will never forget what the boys of Normandy did. Well, let's help her keep her word. If we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. I'm warning of an eradication of that, of the American memory that could result ultimately in an erosion of the American spirit. Let's start with some basics more attention to American history, and a greater emphasis on civic ritual. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do. And that's about all I have to say tonight, except for one thing. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we'd call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with pre-ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I saw it and see it still. And how stands the city on this winter night? More prosperous, more secure, and happier than it was eight years ago. But more than that, after 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the granite ridge, and her glow is held steady no matter what storm. And she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness toward home. We've done our part, and as I walk off into the city streets, a final word to the men and women of the Reagan Revolution, 
the men and women across America who for eight years did the work that brought America back. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger. We made the city freer. And we left her in good hands. All in all, not bad. Not bad at all. And so, goodbye. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America.